it's important to think when you're talking with your prospects, you're discussing the value they get from it, right? Not your features. They don't care if you've automated XYZ workflow. They care, do I have to worry about filing taxes this year or is it automated? Oh, it's automated. Excellent. That's one of the worst things about being an entrepreneur is doing all my taxes. Cool. What's it cost, right? That's the discussion you want to have. Jeremy says, you mentioned no lying and he 100% agrees. Um, he was wondering if you had any tips around honestly pitching the future of your product. So there, there's mm, trusting in your data, being truthful about your data is an internal communication, right? It's you being truthful to yourself, truthful to your team. I am not the kind of marketer who says you should lie when you market because inevitably somewhere in that flywheel, people will wise up and they will yeet out, right? So you don't want to lie, but you can certainly address the value of what you're doing, right? Find the best version of what you have to say and tell that truth. So when you say to somebody, um, you know, hey, you can save uh, five hours a week, 10 hours a week with my product that does X, Y, and Z. Will they say five hours a week? Heck, who knows? Could you say five hours a week? Yes, cool. All right, then. There's your claim you're making, right? It's important to think when you're talking with your prospects, you're discussing the value they get from it, right? Not your features. They don't care if you've automated XYZ workflow. They care, do I have to worry about filing taxes this year or is it automated? Oh, it's automated. Excellent. That's one of the worst things about being an entrepreneur is doing all my taxes. Cool. What's it cost, right? That's the discussion you want to have. That answer your question? Um, give us a post, Jeremy, if that answers your question or not, and we can follow up. Um, I'm curious, in your mind, do you weight all these stages and substages equally, or do some deserve more attention than others when you're trying to figure out what's stopping your business from growing faster? So in the very beginning, most of us on this webinar, probably, we have uh, the main need we have is how to find people to look at us. Attract is the biggest part of it. When you have solved attract well enough, right? When you are getting, like I have a, a, a one of my customers right now, they're getting a couple thousand visits to their webpage, well, all of their webpages every month, right? That's a SaaS product. That's enough, right? You should be able to build on here, but their signups are just, mm -hmm. so now they're over in, into the retain area, right? Nobody likes their offer enough to sign up. And the folks who do sign up, almost all of them, log in for maybe 10 minutes and then go, nope, because their onboarding is too rough. So like performance marketing brought an audience, like content marketing brought an audience. Now you're failing at getting signups. And when you do get signups, you're failing at keeping them around enough to pay. Then you address that part of the funnel. Then if you've got people are signing up, people are paying, but they are not sticking around. Okay. As you're scaling, you can almost think like pre-revenue, it's a tract. Right. Hmm. Once you're in revenue, it's probably retain. If you're going the VC route, after you've done your seed round, you're probably looking at the uh, sorry, convert is the next one. If you're looking at convert is the next stage. Once you're at seed round, A round, and you've got some money now to solve more complicated problems, you want retention because you've proven you can bring people, you've proven they'll pay you, but they're not sticking around. And that now is the time to address that part of it. Right. This tends to be they almost fit into company growth stages by. It's just standard VC rounds. If you're bootstrapped, it's just side gig is a tract, right? <clears throat> Half-time job is now you're going to convert. Once you've gone to, this is my full-time gig, I better work on retention because I'm now getting, you know, I'm bleeding $2,000 a month in revenue. When I have customers churned. It'd be nice if I didn't. Mm. Um, Danish, do you have a question? Yeah, so my question is actually, I'm a three-year developer, a merge tech developer, React and Node. So I'm making a tool, uh, I'm making a SaaS product that teaches learning to JavaScript and ReactJS. So uh, I'm currently experiencing the issue that I'm not able to gain any customers. Means uh, I started a blog, but uh, I don't know how to make more content out of it so that people write something on Google and uh, come into my website and then they convert. And I don't understand the whole process. So I just know that this is the way uh, how to do this, but I don't know actually how to do that. Okay. So how many visitors are you seeing right now 
on your site? So it's so less. It's forty or fifty weekly. Okay, per week. Yeah. Okay. So at forty or fifty a week, you are at a point where you should be able to start to get some signups, right? Some traction should be happening here. Uh, but what you don't know yet, I'm guessing, is how well those people align to what you want them to be doing. For example, right, my website, Crowd Tamers, is not a terribly high traffic website. I don't get tons of people who come, but a whole lot of them who do come book a call. My average revenue per visit, not per sign up, but per visit, is about $14. Because one, my ACV is pretty high, but two, when people come, they are at a high likelihood to take one of my conversion events that I want them to do, right? Sign up for a newsletter, buy one of my info products, or book a call to consult with me. So the way I'm managing that is I'm finding people on Facebook and uh, Reddit and uh, other forums where they're asking specific questions about building and launching their startups, right? I answer those questions. Usually I have a blog article that's relevant. I point them to my blog article. They go, oh, let me read it. Oh, well, that looks good. Let me get some more information from this guy or let me book a call with him or whatever. If you're trying to teach people answers or how to get better at development, you're also offering knowledge, right? Position yeah. yourself as domain expertise and then work on distribution. When you write content, you've done maybe a third of the work for content marketing. The other two thirds of the work are putting the content out there. So if you're not thoughtfully distributing your content, then the content's wasted, right? You've written, uh, you might as well have written something in your journal and locked it away in your desk. If no one reads it, there's no value to it. So if you've got three or five or 10 blog posts already, don't focus on creation, focus on distribution. Then when you brought more people to your site and you start to see what's getting more traction, figure out what it is you want to write next. So you are saying that I should uh, focus on more on Twitter profile building and help people first, and then they, they will come to the, my, my channel, right? Yeah, so specifically when you're helping people, find really only three is what I'm doing, maybe four. Key things you've written that answer a lot of very common questions. I've actually written a post specifically about this. Let me grab the link real quick, um, and you can read it. And then I'll, I'll drop it here in chat because it goes through the whole process of research, write, and distribute that I'm talking about here. Hey, oh, there we go. Uh, that link talks through research, write, and distribute and gives you what you need to know to actually systematize distribution for what you're an expert at. Okay. Thanks, man. Yes, sir. Good question, Dinesh. Thank you. What are two most common mistakes you're seeing from the early stage SaaS founders making one trying to scale? Uh, when you build and you are a builder, you don't generally want to market. You're like, oh, man, marketers are assholes. No one likes them, right? They're slick. They've got stupid mustaches. You can't trust them. And uh, that idea means then you go, I don't want to market my thing. I feel awkward saying, look at this cool thing I built. I already did the work. People should come, right? No. One, no one's heard of you. Two, 90% of the time when you've built it, you don't really know how to tell people about it. You say, hey, look, I made this cool uh, device, uh, cool system that helps you better predict who's going to win in a fantasy football. And so it's, it's AI based and it's fun and no one cares. But if you were to say, hey, crush all your buddies at fantasy football. They'd be like, oh, yeah, I wouldn't mind rubbing, you know, Joe from accounting's face in the dirt with fantasy football. That's an appealing way to phrase it, right? The right way to talk about your business is crucial because it's not feature. It's the value you give. So the two big mistakes I see, one are you don't promote at all. And two is when you do promote, you say, I made a widget as opposed to saying I solved your problem. Mm. Yeah, the problem. The Features versus benefits, I feel like, comes up a lot, especially with the indie hackers. It's yeah, build a cool thing. You should try it, not you have problem, let me fix it. Yeah. So we've got a question here on Twitter, specifically growing your Twitter following. I'd like to maybe expand the scope of that a little bit to just like how you think about social media presence in general. 
So I'm actually not the best at growing your Twitter following because I like I put big effort into it back half of last year and like three X my Twitter following and then fell off the wagon because I was busy with work. Uh, but um, there's there's two ways you can approach growth on on social media. One is to say, I want to have a big following of people. And then every time I say something, some fraction of them will grab it and share. That is valuable. Uh, I There's trade-offs you have to make. Uh, I used to be in charge of a community of about 200,000 people. Uh, and it was back when I was head of marketing at GOG, right? A big bunch of video game nerds, just like me. I'm a big video game nerd. And it is, when you have 200,000 people, you have every possible range of personalities and mental capacity and everything. And it can be very draining to deal with the fact that some of these people are just going to be, they're going to rub you wrong. They're going to be unable to communicate well with each other. There's going to be friction. It can feel very draining to have to deal with that. So as I was looking at, you know, building and growing my social media presence for crowd tamers, I didn't want to build a big presence around me necessarily, where I have to then feel like I own this community and we ha I have to moderate it because that is unmoderated communities almost always devolve into horrible anarchy. Instead, I'm looking for where there is a community, how do I show up and add value? I don't have to own this community, right? If I can contribute like I am to Indie Worldwide, I don't own Indie Worldwide. I don't want to own Indie Worldwide. You're already, what, 3,000 people, 4,000 people? That's enough where I start yeah. to go, <laughs> like, I don't, I don't want to own that. Uh, but I can show up. I can help. I can be a resource people know. And they say, hey, you have a question about that. Go talk to Trevor. And for most people, it's way faster to find a community and join it. And then say, how do I stand out as expert on something? So I would not necessarily advise, particularly in the beginning, you look to get 10,000 or 100,000 followers necessarily. I would say, how do you find communities of 5, 10, 20,000 you can contribute to? And then decide, right, looking at the anarchy of those communities, do I want to own one of those? Or do I maybe want to go, eh, it's okay to just help? There's a, a good video on this topic, too, in the in the archives that I'll share um, about this concept of, like, borrowing an audience versus building an audience. And most of the time, you know, sure, it's great to own your, own your eyeballs, right? But um, if you can figure out how to borrow an audience, you, you know, 90% of the result for 10% of the effort. We've got another one from Jeremy. Um, he says, we've identified a large number of potential markets we could sell to. Would you suggest marketing to a subset first then growing out or trying to market to all of those at once? The thought process is they don't want to be pigeonholed, but they also don't want to be spread too thin. A startup succeeds when it does one thing well. If it succeeds, I would note many startups do not, right? If you spread yourself too thin, you cannot make progress because there will always be, there are too many variables you cannot control or even master to understand what's working. If you have eight different personas you're trying to sell to, you only have one landing page, one homepage. The landing page is going to speak to which one, to who, how is it going to optimize for all of them? It won't. So doing that one very well is important. In the early days, what I would usually recommend I'm a performance marketer. I like using performance marketing to test ideas if you have the capital because you can make eight different variants of a pitch on Google search or on Facebook where you have, to use our fantasy football example, right? Quit letting Bob from accounting win the fantasy football pool every year. Or it could be uh, be the best in your fraternity at fantasy football. Or it could be, uh, you don't need to know all the stats. Our AI is a genius for you, right? Different ways to talk about a fantasy football picker. I don't know why this is in my head. I've never played fantasy football in my life, but whatever. Uh, like those three different ways to talk about it. And you can test each, see which one is getting you clicks. And then when you know which one gets you clicks, build a landing page for that particular offer. And then see if the landing page converts. And if it does, now you know who to approach. And if it doesn't, you took a week. And now you've learned something. I prefer to spend money rather than time because to do this all with organic traffic will take months. But to do it on Facebook takes a thousand bucks in a week. And 
making those trade-offs when you can, if you've got a thousand bucks to spend on learning something, is much more efficient and it lets you, one, not burn out. Because you're like, I built this fancy football AI picker. How do I market it? I don't know, man. Well, you can try one and be wrong for three months and go, oh, this sucks so much. What do I do? I got to pivot. Oh, no. Or test two or three or five or seven ideas in a week. Then you go, oh, this is the one that worked. Now I don't have to churn for months and months and pivot and pivot and wonder what the hell is going on. I answered my question quickly. There's an opportunity cost to that time that you spend. And there's just a life. How much of your soul are you draining out and putting into a product that didn't work that you want to avoid too? So focus on one thing, narrow that niche down, test niches quickly and broadly if you can. But don't assume you can do five things at once because odds are very high you cannot. Um, looks like we got a follow-up from Jeremy. He says their first client is using their app as... Um, HOA management tool, guessing that stands for homeowner association, it says they could attack that market or go after others who can use the platform. Well, so HOA is is interesting. Um, as a first client, it's a little hard to know if that is a good first client, right? They do tend to have money, uh, but do they have the right offer for you? So my inclination is to say, do some outreach to some more HOAs. Hmm. See if you can get them to respond. If you can, cool. Now you know you are the HOA uh, management tool. You brand as such and away you go. I have no idea how crowded that is as a space. Uh, the broader real estate market, I would avoid almost as a rule. It's too broad. Where you might go there, whether it's uh, like if you wanted to go into the uh, property manager space, that is super crowded. There's a bunch of people in that space. If you wanted to go into um, like big corporate asset management or real a commercial asset manager, any of these spaces, it's really hard. Uh, if you can find somebody who's not technologically advanced, solve one of their big problems. And maybe you're only doing, I mean, there's tens of thousands of HOAs in America, right? If you're only doing a couple, what, a million, two million, three million a year as your business and a software business, sure, take it. 300,000, there you go. You had a better, better number than I did. Like, that's a big market. I'm sure other folks are tackling it. If you can find the right way to, to manage it, go there. But first test and see if that one client wasn't a mistake. The last startup I launched for me with a co-founder, co-founder came and said, hey, I've got this product. You want to run it? And I went, okay. Uh, and then I proceeded to go in the hospital for three months and then I had my twin girls born. So I was not like, I was not in good shape, but I did a, a, a I screwed up launching it because we had one client. I went, oh, this is how you do it. And then we rode for four months trying to make more like that one client work. And it didn't. We just had one random fluke client that, we should have tested a lot more before we validated. I was not in my best head, so I didn't do the right mm. work. And so four months later, we closed things because it was going nowhere. So don't just take that one client and go, excellent, YOLO, here we go. Like, check to make sure you can get two, three. The usual rule I give is 10. If you can sell 10 people on your product, odds are you can sell 1,000. But first, get those 10. I'm going to take this question from Dennis Shatalin as the last question. Um, so Dennis asks, um, he's read about uh, your thread on idea validation. Um, he says, as he remembers, you validate, validate in separate steps, offer product, et cetera. Can you elaborate a bit on that process? Yeah, I dropped a, a link to my article, Build and Test a Million Dollar ARR Acquisition Funnel in Nine Weeks. Uh, it is not... I am a marketer. It is nine discrete weeks. It is not necessarily nine weeks sequentially. Um, when I do this as a service for a client, it tends to be 18 weeks. The idea here is as you go through this beginning of attract and convert, I have rather systematized this approach of I bring people in, I'm trying to answer a specific stage of this flywheel so that 
I know once I've gotten past this metric, once I've achieved this sort of number, I'm ready to address the next step. If you go through it this systematic way, it gives you a tool as a product founder who may not be super comfortable with performance marketing or marketing in general. It gives you, this is not the only way to launch a company, but this gives you a successful way and a repeatable way that can help you understand, I need to do these things in this order before I am able to go on to the next step and actually make my, my business grow further. Um, Trevor, thank you so much for, for giving us your time this morning. This was an awesome yeah, presentation. Sure. Um, big shout out to Sparrow Startups once again and MASH for making this come together. Um, if you want more of Trevor, highly recommend following him on Twitter, uh, reaching out in the Indie Worldwide. Uh, Slack is also proven to be effective as well. And checking out the Crowd Tamers blog. Thank you.